You see those mountains behind me? Those are young tertiary volcanics, andesites. Now as a certified geologist, I can tell you right now that those hills over there have gold in them. How do I know? Because I researched the geological maps and I've actually had boots on the ground to determine where the contact zones are for the gold deposits. Now before you put boots on the ground, I highly recommend you do the research first. And what that means is checking your MRDS. Those reports are gonna tell you if anything had been found. Keep in mind, that's not a guarantee because I found many gold deposits where they said it shouldn't be. But to give yourself a head start on finding that gold, I would definitely do the research at home first. You'll save yourself a lot of time unless you're a seasoned pro. And make sure you comb over the USGS reports. They're gonna have vital information in there that's gonna tell you the type of gold they were finding and how much of it. When you see quartz monzonite intruding andesites, you know you're in a good area for finding gold deposits. Get down to the bedrock. Washes are the best place to find that. Here you can see where I've got a lot of basalts, a lot of andesites, and I can see the intrusion of that quartz monzonite. This is the first place I would sample is down in the washes down below the hills. If there's gonna be any gold, a lot of it's gonna be eroded out and down here, unless the vein is below surface. Another good indicator, is pegmatitic quartz and chalcedony. Those two indicators out here in these volcanic districts is also a good sign. Already, I can see exposures of andesite, and because it's green, that tells me it's chloritic andesite. That's one of the best andesites that I've ever found gold in because the chlorite helps dissolve the gold, and then when it boils off during hydrothermal deposition or alteration, then it redeposits again. So look for those green andesites, especially if you have any kind of plutonic intrusions like quartz monzonite. On the outer fracture rings are gonna be the best areas to find heavy mineralization. Whether that's in stock works or your fault gouge or your veinlets. There's that green chloritic andesite. See that quartz vein cutting right through it? Oh, isn't that beautiful? In these hydrothermal systems, you can see all the episodes by these lines. And this was probably just a small fissure at one time, maybe a millimeter, just enough for these hydrothermal fluids to seep in. And as the fault is active and starts to open, more fluids are released and come up through there. You see what they're looking for? It looks like a small silica vein with a whole bunch of bugs. I see some coliform and crustiform in there, multi-generational, and I'll get a hand lens on that and get a closer look, I'll break it open. I got sulfides in the yellow pocket, which is a no-brainer, and a little bit of native gold, not a lot. You can see these very well-defined terminated crystals growing in the bugs. That's always a good sign too. Now, when you hear me say crustiform or coliform, that's just a description of the type of quartz that you're looking at. Usually hydrothermal systems will have that description on it. Now, when you're talking about coliform, that's just the description of the really small nodule crystals that you see in these hydrothermal vein structures, the banding. And it's the same thing that you see in chalcedony, same structure. It's referred to as a cryptocrystalline quartz structure. I know that's a mouthful. And then crustiform, is is on the outer edges of the vugs where you actually see terminated crystals growing. That's all that means, don't get caught up on it, but you will see it in a lot of your USGS reports. Unlike dikes, veins formed by minerals crystallizing out of water in a crack, often near the Earth's surface, and they often form near volcanoes or magmatic intrusions. Veins usually do not have chill margins like dikes do. Dikes can vary in texture and composition as they can range from diabase or basaltic to granitic to rhyolitic. Dikes often form as either radial or concentric swarms around plutonic intrusives, volcanic necks, or feeder vents in volcanic cones. This rhyolitic feeder dike has a northwest strike traveling several miles cutting through older chloritic andesite. Concentrations of hematite can be seen on this feeder dike which means potential for gold deposition. Prospectors have sampled all along this dike checking for gold values, but most of the gold here has been found in parallel veins that can be found on both sides of this rhyolitic feeder dike. Both the gold reed mine and the comet mine have dropped shafts into these near vertical, highly mineralized veins and retrieved a lot of gold. I bet you that was a, a part of a head frame because I can see a, a real old tiny shaft right here. See that? And I'll bet you this connects in with him. 50 bucks, but it's real tiny. Oh, I can feel air blowing out of there, so I know it connects. See this? It looks almost like a man way. But you can see the stopage down there. It wouldn't be nothing to get into this thing. So obviously this one's got to connect. That's if it doesn't have a gate or a plug in it. Let's go take a look. More shearing. More infill. Look at this infill. See that? That silica infill. All the bugs. 
I wouldn't be surprised if I found fluoride in those bugs. A lot of spaces. Manganese oxide in the mix. Big, huge monster pack rats living in here. Look at this. Oh, it's a huge community of pack rats. Man, nasty. And I see some more of that beautiful fault material that they're chasing right along here. Look at this little stall that they used for their ventilation pipe. And what do I see here? A small stope. Right there. I think, if I'm not mistaken, the end of it's right there. Another muck sheet, corrugated metal muck sheet. Timber. Yeah, and there's the end of it right there. All right, let's take a look at this guy. I'm really curious about him. Oh, yeah. See that? Oh, I hope the GoPro can capture this. But yeah, definitely. See the fault right there? And you can see the vein that they are chasing. And right next to it is fault gouge. You see it? And they obviously started stoping. I wonder if there's any good material in there. All right, I'm going to get up in there and see if I can't pull some samples. Because this is what they were chasing. But it doesn't look like it's too rich or else they would have developed it. I want you to take a look at this. This material here, all this rough angler material along the fault. This is fault breccia. See that? And off to the side here, this is fault gouge. See the difference? And right here, I got some limonite that's forming in the oxidation zones. And so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pull this sample because that looks really, really good. Oh, 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 come back here. <sighs> All right, I'll go ahead and put this in my pack. And the, I'm going to pull some more out. That looks really... Oh, that's a good one right there. That's a good one. Not you. Oh, he's going to fall on my head. He's going to fall on my head. Uh. I got crystals. Terminated crystals. Growing in this, this fault zone here. More signs of hydrothermal activity running through here. You can see the clear, distinct zone in this rhyolite. And then, of course, you have this green chloritic andesite. And you can still see little grains of pyrite in the andesite as well. Oh, look, there's a xenolith. I don't know if you can see it. And then you can see a xenolith right there. Do you see it? Just means a foreign rock in the melt. Look at that bug. Isn't that beautiful? Almost looks like chalcedony. I might take that one and sample it, see if there's anything in it. Oh, look at this exploratory shaft. I know it's plugged, but it probably goes down another 15, 20 feet. Another aspect that I found out here was there was a lot of hematite staining, a lot of barite crystals, and a lot of mimetite. Mimetite is a lead arsenic chloride, and it closely resembles wolfenite. In fact, if you get it in your pan, it's going to be identical to wolfenite. And at first, you're going to think it's gold until closer inspection. But it is beautiful. Now, they were finding also calcite, which isn't a no-brainer, along with copper staining out here as well. If you find all those in one particular vein structure, that's the best place to sample. And this is a good example of the vein structure right here. You can see out of this hanging wall here of andesites. I've got this silicified zone here. I've got this altered andesite here. And then over here, I've got a lot of, of the blacks, which are manganese oxide. I got a lot of barite crystal. I got a lot of hematite. And I bet you if I look into these bugs, I'm going to see copper staining and I'm going to find mimetite crystals. So I'm going to focus on this area right here. Now, before I take any samples like chip samples or channel samples, I'm going to run a VLF over it just to see if I've got any pocket gold in there. Because with these types of deposits, it's very common to have small, very rich pockets inside the vein structures. Now, you've seen me a lot with a Gold Monster 1000, but in this particular scenario, I would recommend the Gold Bug 2 over the Gold Monster 1000. And I'm going to tell you why. Now, the first thing you're going to notice when you look up the operational specs for the Gold Bug 2 is that it has a really high operational frequency range of 71 kilohertz, which is much, much higher higher than the Gold Monster 1000. And it's that high operational range you need when you're trying to find load gold. The higher the frequency, the better chances you'll have of detecting out load gold because load gold, generally speaking, is very, very small. And in fact, I would also recommend getting a Falcon MD20, which operates in the range of 400 kilohertz. And that's perfect for finding load gold, but you have to know how to use it. And there's a secret behind it, and I've done many videos on it, and I'll make another video here in the future. So we're gonna have to rely on the gold bug too to sniff out any gold deposits. There's a nice solidified zone. You see the pockets right there? I got a pocket there 
And I got some pockets in here. This is the material I'm mostly interested in, and this is what I'm gonna be checking. Now, another thing I gotta tell you or warn you about is when you start hunting these districts, chances are you're gonna go through a lot of trash and bullets, casings, because people like to come out here and shoot at these areas, especially if there's a road that goes to it. So keep that in mind if you're gonna be running a VLF. All right, let's see what we can find. You wanna get that coil right up against the rock surface, but be aware it's gonna sound off when it bumps. Now I've got my detector tuned a little hot, which means that when I go down, it's gonna sound off just a little. That way I have a better chance of finding that ultra fine gold. But keep in mind, it's gonna get chirpy. That's nice. Right there. Hear how crisp that is? And it's in that pocket. So now we gotta remove it. Now for any of you out there that have ever done hard rock mining, you know exactly what I'm up against. But for you new folks out there, extraction is the hardest part. Finding it is the easy one. So I'm gonna have to either chip this out by hand, use electric jackhammer, an air jackhammer, or if you have an FEL license, you can blast it out. Now I know this guy right here was sounding off, so I'm definitely taking this little pocket. You can either take the entire vein, or you can do what's called a channel sample, where you channel across the vein. Those are important if you don't know if the vein has gold in it. So what you're doing is you're channeling from the hanging wall through all the vein structure and back into the foot wall. That way, if you do find gold, you can go back and try to isolate the particular particular zone where that gold was coming from. It's the fastest and easiest way to sample these hydrothermal vein systems when you're out in the field. These are the bugs that you're looking for. See that? I've got calcite, I got the mimetite crystals, and a lot of barite. Oh, and I got free mill gold. And of course, hematite in there too. Yeah, there's definitely free mill right there. At the end of every month, we give away bags and bags of pay dirt from our drift mine. And we also give away a brand new MineLab Gold Monster 1000 metal detector. You can't beat that. If you want to get involved with that, just look for the little icon at the end of the video that looks something like that. Click on it, make a $10 pledge to become eligible to win. And if you want to see more videos of us in the mines looking for gold, go ahead and watch this video. And we'll see you on the next video.